everybody. This is Margie Meacham, and I am back with another episode for the Brain Matters podcast. And today I am talking with Barb Smith. She is the, a web developer and social media consultant. Um, she is president of Barb Smith Design. And full disclosure, everything you see about our podcast, my website, my Twitter, my Facebook, she is my go-to person, our web guru and social media guru. So I asked her here today to talk about what she does in terms of how it can help the learning professional. So welcome, Barb. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Hi, Margie. Thanks for having me as your guest today. Um, as you know from personal experience, I'm um, a web consultant and work closely with you on learningtogo.info, um, which is a mashup of blogging, posting to social media channels, an email newsletter, and also a website and, um, and podcast as well. So starting in the mid-90s, when web technologies were just beginning to take off, I worked as a web developer um, for in academia and then later on worked in the corporate sector. So I have a pretty uh, vast array of experience across those sectors. And at the time when I first started in the 90s, I had no idea how the internet would take off and change our world and eventually become such a powerful communication tool. So um, that is really the synopsis of my background and um, just happy to be here with you today and talking about what I love to do. Well, I'm glad you gave such an extensive description of what you do for me because that is really kind of one of my points that I want to explore is that it's not enough today to have a website or to have a blog or to, to be involved in social media. It really is, as you say, a mashup of things. And I use the term digital presence. Um, so uh, for a professional um, in any line of work, why is it important to have a digital presence in today's social world? Well, what I would do is ask you to ask yourself, where do you go to get your information? And it's most likely to be on the web. And, um, and that is really where you need to be, whether you have a business or whether you're working and have um, you know, a resume that you would like to have out there. LinkedIn is wonderful for that. Um, and also just to have a presence overall that keeps you engaged in what's going on uh, in your areas of interest. And it's just an important um, thing to consider that used to be optional and no longer is optional. Uh, a lot of people have shied away from it over the years because they didn't understand it or they didn't think that it was really important for them to be to have a web presence. And today I would say it's an absolute must no matter who you are, whether you are um, you have your own business or whether you're working for a company. It is a very, very important part of your identity. Okay, and I totally agree with you, obviously. So there are probably some folks listening right now who are learning professionals. They are either independent consultants and authors, or they are um, an internal consultant working inside some kind of organization. And right now they're thinking, you know what? That is probably true. And I have little or no digital presence. So how did they get started? Uh, the best way to get started if, if you have zero web presence would be to first have a website. And what I would suggest is that you keep that as simple as possible to begin with. I think what happens to a lot of people when they're first starting out is they look at the big picture and think they have to do everything all at once. And that can be a very daunting task for anyone. So I would suggest that you start with a very simple website. And, um, and that would be about three pages, a home page, um, an about me page, and a contact me page. And, um, and that would be a very humble beginning and a very doable uh, project. Uh, I would highly suggest that you look into uh, services like wordpress.com, which is actually the platform that hosts your site, Margie, uh, and begin there. There are a lot of tutorials on there. There's a lot of tutorials out there on YouTube and elsewhere that can help you uh, 
get up and going. But that would be the best place for you to start. And then from there, you can expand. You can expand to social media, uh, perhaps to, you probably already have a LinkedIn account. And if you don't, you should. Uh, then to Twitter and Facebook. And, but don't try to take it on all at once. That would be my advice to you. Start simple, take baby steps, and eventually grow when you feel comfortable enough to do so. Okay. And is this expensive to do? Uh, not really. I actually, if you, if you did, and I am not promoting WordPress.com, although I probably will mention it a few more times throughout this conversation is because it is my WordPress is my go to platform for building websites because it's simple. It's it's quick and uh, it's a very robust platform. So if you go to WordPress com. you can probably, you can start with a free account there. So it's absolutely no cost to you. And I think it's a good way to start to get your feet wet with no expense to see if it's something that you really want to do. From there, you can actually pay to have more or more robust um, presence, but still we're only talking about $100 a year. So it, it's a very manageable uh, endeavor financially to start out both as a free site and then as a paid site it really is not that expensive and you know i'd like to throw out also to um uh, instructional designers and trainers that you should consider that you might be able to use some of the social media as an adjunct to your training efforts so you can have a facebook page for your class, for example, or you can drive your students to your blog for additional information and articles that you find interesting. So um, it does, it's not all about sales. It can be about education as well, don't you think, Barb? Precisely. Uh, you, you need to look at your website, your blog, your newsletter, your social media presence, all as communication tools. And the beauty of all of those tools is that they can integrate really beautifully together to present you and your brand as, as, an, as an expert in your field and use it as well as, you know, posting videos, or you having a YouTube channel, having a podcast on iTunes, having a newsletter, all of these things add to your brand and your credibility. Uh, so think about how you want to sell yourself and look at the tools that are available available to you through social media and your website. And don't be so fearful of how to do it. Just jump in and start doing it as simply as you can. And once it starts to take off, you'll start to feel more and more comfort comfortable with the process. I agree. And I just want to throw out a plug to all my colleagues out there. Um, even if you believe you are fully employed right now, Every single one of us is always an independent contractor. Um, your employment situation could change at a moment's notice, and that is the worst time to start scrambling and realize that you need to have these things in place. So building your brand, no matter what your current situation, is something you should start doing and keep doing on a regular basis. And that's just some uh, personal advice to all my friends out there. So let me switch um, now and let's talk about somebody who, okay, I've already got that stuff. I've been, you know, I've been doing it. I have a Facebook page. I've, let's say they have all this going on. What are some of the mistakes that you see people make with their social media presence and their content? Uh, common mistakes that people make is not doing it at all. Uh, you have a website, you have a blog, you have a blog, you have social media, and you're not actively posting to those sites. And so think about when you go to a site and you see the same content all the time, it becomes stale. There is nothing there to engage you in the process. So once you make the commitment to have a, a digital presence, keep active in it. Come up with a plan with what is doable for you. There are no rules for how often you should do it, but truthfully, the more often you are posting, the, the more engaging you are with your audience and them with you. So um, just be conscious of that, that it, that it is a commitment and that if you, if you feel comfortable posting once a week or every day or once a month, try to be consistent with that. 
so that people know what to expect from you on, on your time frame. Uh, another mistake is not being patient with the process. So it can take, keep in mind, it, it takes years to build a following. And, and Margie, you know about this. When we first started out, you know, we had how many people on our mailing list? We started out with maybe 10. And so you're thinking you're doing all this work for a newsletter that you're sending out and it's only going to 10 people. And then years down the road, now you have hundreds of people or thousands of people who are, who are in your net um, for that communication. So, and it's the same thing with Twitter and Facebook. It, you, you have to be patient with the process of developing a following and just remain persistent in, in that process that you continue to keep your eye on the prize down the road of growing a larger audience and, and each thing that you do, each post that you make gets you closer to that goal. Yeah, I think I remember our first newsletter went to 65 people, and that was mostly friends and family. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. And I think the podcast had even fewer um, subscribers. And as you know, um, we are now one of the top 10 podcasts for learning and develop professionals, which I really have to start saying at the beginning of the program to remind everybody. <laughs> and that's thanks to your hard work and your advice and all our wonderful guests. And, of course, to the listeners who care, who really care about hearing this kind of information. So is there a checklist or a, um, some way that someone could kind of do an audit of where they're at right now with their social presence? Uh, yes, there, there is. And I, I think that to start with, with just a few questions, um, you should ask some of these. Uh, number one is, what is my purpose for having a website, a blog, a podcast, a newsletter? Uh, go ahead and create a roadmap for where you want to go with that uh, before you even start. Uh, it can be, if you don't have a roadmap, then you can kind of go off in different directions and really feel lost, and that can be a very um, frustrating experience. So start small and grow when it feels right would be my suggestion to you and know where you want to go before you take the first step. Um, next would be who is my audience? Uh, identify your audience and make your content speak to them directly. Uh, remember that engagement is the key in using your digital presence as the powerful tool that it is. Uh, next would be where is my voice and what should I talk about? Um, find your niche for, for what you have a passion for and talk about that. Really feel like you're talking directly to your audience rather than at them. That is, that is a very critical part of being having, again, that engagement that you want to have. And keep in mind that, you know, you'll be asking yourself, well, how can I learn how to do all this? Um, as I said before, YouTube and just Google it go online, get the information, use the tool for what it's good for. There are so many people out there doing what you want to do. They're doing it already. Find who you like and follow them as an example. And then probably the last question, and this is not self-promotion, would be, should I hire somebody to do it for me? And the good news is that you don't have to. Uh, if you don't mind the learning curve and the time commitment, you can learn how to do this and you can add to your skill set, which is not a bad thing to have in your back pocket. Uh, but if you are too busy, and some people are, you know, just too busy and they, they don't have the time to do it, you can find people like myself who will mentor you, who will do the work for you, will give you whatever it is you need to support you through your process. Uh, I would say those would probably be the initial first questions that you should be asking yourself uh, to improve your web presence. That is a great list. Thank you, Barb. And, you know, the description that you have about the, you know, the phrase, just Google it and go to YouTube. And um, that's really um, been recognized recently. This learner behavior, this self-direction uh, has a name and it's really being studied. It's called digital learning. And it's the idea that when we want to learn something in just our everyday lives, that's the first thing we do. We jump online mm -hmm. and we figure it out. We find out who's already figured this out for me and we learn from each other. Then we get into a corporate environment and 
we become far more passive and we wait until our employer schedules us to go take training. And a lot of folks are trying to, are recognizing that this just is crazy. Our brains are already hardwired to explore and to be, uh, and to seek out solutions to our problems. So when we put someone into a passive frame of mind, we are losing all of that wonderful investigative power and we are slowing down the learning process. So how can we make corporate learning more like Googling it? And so it's funny because you know how once you become aware of something, you start seeing it everywhere, which is part of how your brain works um, because it becomes a heat seeking missile. I have been seeing digital learning in almost every conversation that I've been having lately. And, and here's a case in point. Um, I didn't anticipate we'd be talking about it, but sure enough, your advice is uh, to leverage that digital learning and take advantage of technology to just get out there and find it for yourself. It's so true. So much of what I even learned over the years and growing my skill set has been just taking advantage of all the information that's already out there. Uh, so it, it, you know, it makes me look smart, but really I have just kind of ridden on the coattails of all the people before me who have figured this all out for themselves. And so that learning process, that is truly how most of uh, my knowledge has been acquired is through um, that pool of information that's out there on the web already. Okay. Now, so everybody, that's a great example. It can be done. Now, I'm going to uh, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit here, Barb. And I did um, give you a heads up that I wanted to talk about this because you spent a good part of your year in the Florida Keys, and you recently had to evacuate to escape Hurricane Irma. And we're so glad that you're safe. But I'd like to explore a little bit about how it felt to be caught up in that very dangerous event, because it's on everybody's mind. And of course, Irma is not the last very serious storm we're going to have in that part of our country and that part of the world. So uh, do you have any insights you want to share with us about what it's like to be caught up in something like that? Yes, I, I do. Unfortunately, I do. Uh, but I'm actually grateful for the experience of one of the things that has really struck me is, is, is how we sit in front of our TVs and watch things unfold that are really very catastrophic. And we feel for those people and situations, but we don't really know what it like, it's like to be there. And so there is somewhat of a detachment from it that, um, that, I, that I'm grateful for the experience because I, I really, my heart really goes out to these people even more so because we were impacted by it as well. Uh, at first, we evacuated from uh, Key Largo to Orlando thinking that pretty sure we packed everything that we possibly could into our car and went to Orlando thinking that we were getting a, far enough away from the storm. And, and we were coming to grips with the fact that we were going to lose our home. We were certain of that. There was no way it was going to survive the impact of a cat four or five hurricane. And so there was a process with all those belongings and things that you have that you don't want to lose. And yet we could put it in a perspective of it wasn't our primary home. We were going to lose a place that we love to go to, but we weren't in the place of other people who would certainly lose everything they had because it was their primary home. So we felt in some ways trying to put it in perspective that way that it would be painful, but we could get through it. And then when we were in Orlando and thought we were in the crosshairs of the eye, now we started thinking about our personal safety. And that shifted the focus to that. And we, we evacuated up to Mississippi to get completely out of the state of Florida. And, and we were safe and we were okay. Then we found out that our home did make it through. It suffered some damage, but you know, damage that we could repair, but saw pictures of neighbors all around us whose homes were completely demolished. And so again, there is that sense of, wow, we were lucky, but others weren't. So that balance was still there. And, um, you know, then, then there's the whole part of it that we're still going through, which is an emotional, mental trauma of going through something like that and now having to move through the process of trying to rebuild, should we rebuild? Do we want to be there? Do we feel the same way about it? Uh, it, it was a very 
sobering experience and it and it will be ongoing for many years i'm sure so let's talk about uh there's a couple of things going on in the neuroscience of what you've experienced and this may help other folks who have experienced any kind of a traumatic event um, whether they were swept up in a natural disaster or it was something else and our brain interprets trauma and, and identifies things as traumatic even you know, it's very personal. So someone else might say, oh, that was no big deal. But for example, uh, being laid off uh, from a job you love and, and rely on can be just as traumatic. And you have a lot of things going on. Uh, you mentioned the empathy that you get for other people. Suddenly now things are a lot more real. And there's this uh, almost a bargaining, if I do this, I'll be safe. And then that's not enough. And then, you know, you need to, you recognize you have to take another step. So um, there's those things going on. And then there's the stages of grief that start to happen. And I imagine you're somewhere along the line in those stages now with what's happened to your home and what can you salvage. And, and obviously, even if you salvage some of it, everything's going to be different going forward. So we know all those things are going on. And yet most people who go through something like that almost immediately have to pick up and start going back into everyday life. They have to, for example, do their job and pick up the pieces with their family and help someone who's less fortunate than them. So in some ways, uh, circumstances don't often give you the chance to adequately uh, make time for yourself to go through these phases and to process it. So one thing I'd recommend to anybody listening is, and, and certainly to you as well as a friend, is to give yourself time to relive it and to think through it and to say, what's it mean to me? Because there's an awful lot going on there that um, you can observe objectively, but you can't necessarily get past it without letting your brain do what it needs to do. And that can take some time. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that. It is, it's, it's, you think that once you're, you're in a safe place and you know, for, at first it wasn't knowing what was going to happen. And then when it did happen, then you think, well, you're, you'll be fine when every, you know, everything settles down, but um, it does, it does take time. It's, it's trauma that I have not experienced before. And there, there's even, I'll add this as, as a point of interest is that, when we found out that our home was repairable and, and our damage wasn't that severe compared to others, there was a sense of guilt that we didn't get hit as hard as others and um, because it wasn't our primary home. So there's, there's this whole mental thing going on that I find very interesting and I keep reflecting on, oh, why am I feeling that way? That's really interesting thought that I'm having. Why would I feel that way? So it's it's definitely a unique experience for me, for sure. Yeah. And that process of being very self-aware and it's called metacognition of studying what you're thinking um, speeds up the process. So most of us do that instinctively, but when you're aware of it, it, uh, it works even better. So that's another skill that people can take away. But I'm also curious about um, the science of climate change. I have seen a lot of folks saying, you know what? Uh, you mentioned that this makes things more real. It also made climate change more real for a lot of people. Was there, were there any things you saw as a longtime resident of that area that told you that what's happening in the last few years is significant and different? Absolutely. And I have a, a very interesting vantage point for that because I am um, a scuba diver. And so as a diver, I have the personal experience of being under the surface of the water. And one of the, the most enjoyable parts about being a scuba diver is being able to see the reefs, the coral reefs. But what is most alarming is over the past several years, that the water temperature down in the Keys has gotten extremely warm and it is continuing to get warmer and warmer. Now keep in mind, when you think about when the meteorologists were telling us about these storms gaining strength, what was fueling them? Running over warm water. So the water temperatures down in the Keys are up around 90 degrees. 
So it's, it's like jumping into a bathtub at times. And, um, and it's, it's wonderful to swim in that, but the reality is, is that the ecosystem, uh, especially the coral reefs, are being impacted by that heat. And what's happening is that the reefs are actually beginning to die. And they're bleaching is what they call it because the, the, the water is just too warm for them and, and they're dying. And, and coral is an animal. Um, and so they are actually dying back. And so as a diver and being very interested in the conservation of our oceans, um, and it's an up close and personal reality check for me and for other people involved in that, that look at our reefs and our ocean as the, uh, the canary in the mine shaft for the effects of global warming. Um, uh, what I could say is there are, are people who don't believe in this um, and others that do, and it can become a very political hot topic, but science is showing us that this is a reality. And whether we accept it or we reject it, it's not going to change the reality that the that the ocean waters are warming and it's having a very detrimental effect to our environment. I agree. And uh, to bring it back to the subject at hand, although I tell people all the time, look, if you if you are a learning professional, if you are in training, education, teaching, you're a college professor, even a business leader of any kind, because all of that involves teaching, then de facto you are a science worker. You need to care about science, and whether you recognize it or not, you are utilizing science in what you do. Cognitive science and neuroscience and psychology and economics and all those things are science. So um, to pull us back a little bit more, a little bit back to specifically learning science, tell me something you're working on right now that has got you really excited. What has me really excited is the prospect of growing your website um, <laughs> to new heights. So it's a very, that's a very exciting thing for me. Um, over the past three years, you know, we've grown your web presence significantly. And, uh, and it, we're at the point where we have a little bit of growing pains going on and it's, it's time to spread our wings a little bit more. If you like the sound of that, that's why I recommend her services. So uh, how does somebody get in touch with you, Barb, so you can become just as passionate about their business as you have been for mine? Uh, you can go to my website. It's barbsmithdesign.com. Uh, there is, you can look at some of the work that I've done, and there's contact information on there. Yeah, you will see it on our write-up that goes with this podcast. And, of course, you can also catch our podcast on iTunes, iTunes or right from our site, learningtogo.info. And you have been listening to the Learning to Go Brain Matters podcast with Barb Smith, the president of Barb Smith Design, web developer and social media consultant extraordinaire. Thank you so much for your time, Barb. Thank you, Margie. And, everybody, thanks for listening, and please join us for another podcast soon. Thank you.